My name is Mark Evans. I'm a scientist on an unusual mission. I'm hunting down the DNA of the most famous people who ever lived. My aim is to find out who they really were. I'm looking for his body parts. His body parts? I'm acquiring the last remains of the greatest artists, scientists, even presidents. That's Abraham Lincoln's hair taken the night of the assassination. That is a bit of Elvis. I'm then extracting the DNA to try and read the genetic code containing their physical, medical and behavioural traits. As far as I know, this is all that remains of Brando that we can sequence his DNA from. Could the DNA reveal what made Marilyn Monroe so attractive, Albert Einstein so intelligent, or Adolf Hitler so evil? My mission is no doubt controversial, but I intend to cross this moral minefield and use science to rewrite history. I need to trust you that it is yeah. absolutely Adolf Hitler's. On my journey, I'm also meeting people thinking of bringing the... You're sort of envisaging a kind of conveyor belt of John Lennon's. Well, if it works once, it's going to work again, right? This is the incredible world of dead, famous DNA. It is absolutely mind-blowing. Last time on Dead Famous DNA, I found hairlocks of Mad King George III and the King of Rock and Roll. My scientific team attempted to extract their DNA and analyse their genomes, the genetic blueprint of life. Though Mad King George's hair didn't contain DNA. Seriously? It was a wig. But a hairlock claimed to be Elvis's led to groundbreaking science. This genome of a dead person that has died a long time ago is the best genome we have ever done. The genetic code seemed to reveal his true cause of death. He had heart muscle disease. Knowing that DNA can offer new insights into the lives of historic figures, I'm more determined than ever to continue my quest. there's one intriguing investigation still in play. I managed to get hold of body parts claimed to have come from Adolf Hitler and his wife, Eva Braun. OK, so have you got the hair? One hair sample was sold to me by disgraced historian David Irving. It supposedly came from the Fuhrer's barber. Was this stuck to the bottom of a barber's shoe? That's the question. Irving put me in contact with an anonymous relic collector who handed over bones claimed to have come from Hitler and Braun, stolen from the KGB. In Berlin, 1945, the Russians discovered two charred corpses believed to have been Adolf Hitler and Eva Braun. Scorched bones were taken from their shallow grave back to Moscow. So could the bones now in my possession really have come from this same grave? I need an expert to examine them and arrange a meeting with forensic archaeologist Professor George Milner. He warned me that most of these ancient relics turn out to be fakes, usually taken from an animal. First off, what do you think of that? So is it human? Yes, this bone is definitely human. It is part of the uh, a cervical vertebra, which is one of the neck vertebra. Right, because I, I originally thought when I first saw it, it just looked very small. It is uh, from a smallish individual, but it is definitely from an adult. OK, so adult, can you have any kind of hazard of a guess of male or female? It'd be a small male, or it'd be much more consistent of a, with a female. OK. In terms of the burning, is that consistent with a cremation, a, a kind of a rushed gasoline fueled cremation. Well, that would be possible. If you look here where you have the disc in between all of our vertebrae, well, you can see that the burning is peripheral, not in the disc area itself. So which suggests there were soft tissues present when, when it was burning? That's correct. Okay. This could be female, 
definitely human and is potentially consistent with a cremation of a body which had flesh on it. That's all correct. Yes. Wow. That is allegedly a piece of Adolf Hitler's rib. Well, this is very definitely a part of a rib. I'm starting to um, sweat a bit here now, George. You do, you do realise this, 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 this is, is quite extraordinary now. We also have uh, burning um, on this individual. What you have here is the sternal end of a rib. The burning is not on the place here where the costal cartilage would have attached. So again, that consistent with That's a correct. cremation of a body that had flesh still on it. That's correct. Okay. First off, this is uh, from a somewhat older individual. You see that little black portion sticking off to one side? Yep. That is the uh, natural consequence of aging. Can you be any more f definitive about, put some numbers to that? Somewhere in the late 40s or 50s. Okay, so, and what about size of this individual, sex? Well, it's a big rib, more consistent with a larger bodied individual, perhaps a male. There's a few ticks here. That's right, it, it falls in the direction where you'd like to, to see it fall. It'd be fascinating if indeed they turned out to be the uh, uh, remains of Eva Braun and uh, Adolf Hitler. Okay, interesting. Very, very interesting. I suppose deep down, I would pretty much convinced myself that George was gonna say, it was a con, a hoax, and that he'd tell me that the bones were maybe deer. But I never anticipated he was gonna say those bones were human. And then to give me pretty much an exact age and gender profile of Adolf Hitler and Eva Braun, it's just mind blowing. And then to say that the bodies had been barbecued, I mean burnt, with the flesh on. Very spooky. And if those bones aren't Adolf Hitler and Eva Braun, who are they? Clues to the bones' origins will lie in the DNA, but can I find a country willing to analyze Hitler's body parts. So that's a no from Canada, and no from the USA. Portugal says no, Spain says no, Italy says no, France says no. In the UK, it's illegal. Norway, no, Sweden, no, Finland, no. Russia, they wouldn't return my calls, so they're out. India, no, surprise me. Same true of China, no. Australia, said yes, and then they realised they weren't actually capable of doing it, so they're no. Israel, little Israel, said yes, and then bottled it. So they're a no as well. In all, 65 labs in 25 countries all said no to sequencing Hitler's genome because they all reckoned Hitler is too hot to handle. But finally, one lab said yes. You've got to love Belgium. My Hitler task force is made up of Belgian geneticists and German forensic scientists who specialize in cold cases. Supposedly Adolf Hitler's hair collected on sellotape that his barber supposedly put on the underside of his shoe 
I then hand over another lock of Hitler's hair, a lock of Eva Braun's, and the two bone samples. Well, now that's from Eva Braun. So I'm definitely like human. It looks him, yes, I would say so. But there's another one. Uh, and that's this. Mm -hmm. from Allegedly from Adolf's body. Mm -hmm. And claimed to be a section of one of his ribs. Mm -hmm. It's burned. But of course, there's many traces of, let me say, carbonization. Of course, in these black areas, you will never retrieve DNA. But in the other regions, it depends on the temperature. But maybe in the central parts mm -hmm. of the bone, one has a good, let me say, chance. And the DNA is still in them. This is obviously a hugely controversial subject because it surrounds Adolf Hitler. Were, did you have second thoughts? Did your family or friends say to you, look, you don't get involved in this? My family doesn't know anything <laughs> about this. No, it's not anybody from uh, the family saying or anything yeah. about this, so we kept it secret. Scientifically uh, challenging, but historically it would be nice to say, are these in the, indeed uh, the bones of Eva Braun and Adolf Hitler? Yes or no? It's uh, looking for the truth. Extracting and analysing the DNA will take several months. All I can do is wait. In the meantime, I'm going to shop around for body parts of other fascinating historical characters. One of the aims of my mission is to create a Noah's Ark of dead famous DNA for generations to come. So I'm constantly looking to scoop up body parts of historical figures. I've arranged to meet one of the world's top geneticists, Professor Stefan Schuster, who's received a few strands of Charles Darwin's hair from his great-great-grandson. But he didn't have any hair on his head. Yes, but he had a lot of facial hair. It's a beard. It's a beard but we will only use one-tenth of the hair. So I'm pretty much working with just a couple of hairs. Charles Darwin, one of the world's greatest scientists who unlocked the secret of how life evolved on Earth. So how apt if we can use modern science to unlock the secrets within his DNA? Sequencing a human genome from a couple of strands of beard has never been attempted before. But if the professor succeeds, what can the DNA of one of our greatest Britons tell me? I soon discover that Darwin suffered from a debilitating mystery illness for most of his life. He had stomach problems, skin issues, heart symptoms, fatigue and headaches. Desperate to find a cure, Darwin tried 18 different doctors. Darwin was a prolific letter writer, which is absolutely brilliant when you're trying to research the man himself. And he says in here, I have been extra bad of late with the old severe vomiting and much distressing swimming of the head. And he says here in his letter to his friend Joseph Hooker, I have been so poorly these last three days that I sometimes doubt whether I shall ever get my little volume done. <laughs> That's extraordinary, isn't it? I mean, he's referring to arguably the most important piece of work in the history of biology on the origin of species. And he refers to it as his little volume. So what was wrong with Darwin? And did the answer lie in his DNA? Hungry to investigate Darwin's mystery illness, I've arrived at his former home in Kent to question his great-great-granddaughter. The strands of Darwin's beard are at least 130 years old. During that time, the DNA would have degraded, 
reducing the chances of sequencing his complete genome. Fortunately, the hair has been protected from the damaging effects of the sun in an envelope inside his daughter's writing box. He used to vomit quite often in the mornings and his butler used to carry this sort of smelly stuff away to the, to the, to the kitchen area. So is that what that partition was for, to give him some privacy? Yeah. He's dying to get to his work, but he is too, feeling too nauseous to do it. So he would have shivering fits, but sometimes he would have dreadful insomnia, and then he would also have hysterical sobbing in the night. What do you think he was suffering from? I don't know. You're the scientist. You tell me. Historians and scientists have long debated the cause of Darwin's sickness. Did he catch a tropical disease? Was he poisoned by arsenic? Did he have dysentery? To this day, no diagnosis has been reached. Most of Darwin's children were also sickly. Three out of the ten died, including his beloved eldest daughter, Annie. Darwin suspected he had an inherited illness and blamed himself for inbreeding and passing on his poor health. He knew what he'd done. He knew that he'd married his first cousin. And he was, he was sure that it was an inherited disease. When he talks about nature as the devil's, a, a devil's chaplain, nature is relentless, it is not benign, and the, the strongest will, will flourish and the weak will go to the wall. And he had seen, in a sense, in Annie's death, watching her, the poor child die, he had seen his own theory in action. A hundred years before the discovery of DNA, Darwin believed his illness was what we'd now call genetic. I'm hoping to find out whether the father of evolution was right. Yeah, well, I've got the whole of the rest of the day free, so I can come over whenever. Have you got the penis with you? Or have you got to get it out of storage? OK, that's cool. We'll give it, give it an hour then and I'll be with you. OK. Cheers. See you later. Bye. I've arrived in New Jersey to meet Evan Latimer, daughter of a renowned urologist who was bequeathed a severed penis, claimed to be Napoleon's. It was supposedly cut off during his autopsy by a resentful doctor. 150 years later, Evan's father bought it at a Paris auction in 1977 for $3,000. Evan is very protective of her prized possession. I need to be at my most persuasive to even inspect it. He bought it, he never showed it to anyone, he never told anyone, he just took it, put it under the desk, and there it was. It was always, always referred to as the Napoleon item. Item, yes. Never yeah. a penis. <laughs> no, Dad believed that urology should be elegant and proper and decent and not a joke. Can I have a look at it? You can. Yes. So it's a little, it's just a little wooden box. Was this, was this the crate it came in? It was. Wow. Slightly bizarre, this. This is literally what got delivered by yeah. a courier or whatever to your front door. Indeed. In here, all beautifully protected by foam in there. <laughs> so, wow, look at that. We're not allowed to open it beyond here because, obviously, that's, that's the objective, is not to have it televised or whatever. So how, how many people have actually seen it? Ten. It was acquired during the autopsy. The uh, manservant that was there wrote, we took off pieces. And it was in, it's been in the inventory for a long time. Usually they call it a tendon or a, a piece of flesh or this or that. This is a beautiful, exquisite little example of what it is. Um, the, at the university, they've done uh, x-rays and other examinations of it. It's, it's obviously what it is. Um, you're, you're teasing me with this now. I'm desperate to want no, to, be able you to cannot. see it. No, but you I, even if we don't, I mean, I know you don't like, you don't want it filmed. But yes. can't I just have a look at it myself? Maybe when we're away from a camera. Yes. If I even if I turn it away from the camera and just have a look at it this way and just turn the lid up, is that all right or not? Could I? Okay. Yeah. Sure. Oh wow. 
but it is a magnificent little little item. I mean, it's clearly what it is. Very, very small. small. It is very small, but it's famous for being small. I mean, I've seen a, a lot of penises, from a chihuahua oh, to a sperm go. whale. Yes. And this is very small. It's, it's, this it's this very doesn't actually. It doesn't look. It's so, it's so within well, it doesn't, it could be a penis, but... It is perfect. Structurally, that's what it is. Actually, if that is Napoleon's penis sitting on my knees, the last place on earth I would have expected to find it is New Jersey. Indeed. It's strange how the withered penis has ventured further around the world than Napoleon ever did. What a story. But is it true? If we could sequence Napoleon's genome, or the, the, the genome of the owner of that penis, and actually validate that and verify it against other relics that, that might exist. If there were some way to absolutely guarantee that there was a, a correct item uh, that we could compare it against, sure, we'd be up for it. If I can get inside that box, I wonder what I'd learn from the little severed item of the favourite son of France. But how am I going to convince her to let me get my hands on it? So far on my journey, I've been buying up body parts of the dead famous and analysing their DNA for physical, behavioural and medical traits. But I've realised I can also use the genome to study ancestry and solve paternity cases. In America, there's a long list of people who claim to be Elvis's love child. If I do have Elvis's genetic code, I could finally offer them proof. We all have 23 pairs of chromosomes, but just two of them, X and Y, define our sex. So if you have two X chromosomes, you're female. If you have an X and Y, you're male. And the Y chromosome gets passed on pretty much unchanged from father to son. So my Y chromosome will be the same as my dad's and the same as my grandfather's. Now, intriguingly, if you trace back the ancestry of all men alive today, you end up with just 20 ancestral fathers spread all over the world. If you go back even further, then you end up with just one ancestral father, and he's known as Y chromosome Adam. If he was just one human being, then he would have left Africa about 60,000 years ago. I'm aiming to compare Elvis's Y chromosome to Tim Farrell's from Michigan. He had the most compelling love child story. In 1978, he was told he's Elvis's son, and ever since has been desperately seeking the truth. Why do you think Elvis was your dad? Well, that's not the best question, because I don't think he is my dad. I want to know if he is. My mother made the claim I never did. From a young age, Tim dreamt of being a musician, unaware Elvis could be his father. After the King died in 1977, Tim's mum announced to the press that Elvis is his dad. Tim found out from a journalist whilst auditioning to join a hotel band. I guess I'll never know the reason why you love me as you do. That's wonder, wonder of you. I was sort of upset that she had done this without talking to me, but at the same time I was very excited that uh, I was getting all this attention as a 23-year-old, and I thought it was really cool, you know, this is going to be a fun thing, but it wasn't long before it became more of a burden than, than fun because... Uh, you know, if suddenly I was not Tim getting this great gig at this great hotel, it was, a, you know, this guy that thinks he's Elvis Presley's kid. And it became a stigma after some time. And it, 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 pretty, much, it pretty much ruined what I had been working on for myself for years to just play music for a living. What was her reason for She thought that everyone it? should know because now that Elvis was dead, there wouldn't be any fights, there wouldn't be any uh, fraternity suits, there wouldn't be anything that would embarrass him or her. And she just thought that the world ought to know. That's a wonder, wonder Tim finally fell out with his mum and didn't talk to her until she was diagnosed with cancer. 
again, she insisted he's Elvis's son. Thank you very, very much. She died in 2002, leaving behind her diaries. She talks about me, my childhood, my music, growing up, and she talks about the Elvis thing in here. He never knew Elvis was his father until January of this year. No one did. Elvis is Tim's father, but it's a long story. I'll tell you later if you need to hear it from me. And she goes on to talk about uh, my singing and that I didn't get it from her because she can't carry a tune. And I knew he sounded like Elvis, and everyone that heard him sing remarked about it. Searching for the truth, Tim contacted the Presleys for a DNA test, but was refused. So I take a swab and remind him I don't yet know for sure I have Elvis's genome. It's an incredible story. I want to know if it's true or not. I mean, of all the people in the world, she chose this guy to, to name. I had nothing to do with it. I didn't know anything about it until I was grown, off on my own. I want to know if he's my dad or not. I'll send Tim Swab to the lab. If there's a match with the DNA from my Elvis hair sample, he must be the king's son. Until then, we wait. So I have Hitler and Braun in a Belgian lab, two strands of Darwin's beard with the prof, and I'm soon to find out if Tim Farrell is the son of Elvis. But on the menu are two more locks of hair that I can't resist, and it means flying to Puerto Rico. I'm about to meet relic collector Jesse Briggs, a self-proclaimed multi-millionaire and former hairdresser to the stars. But this place doesn't seem the obvious retirement destination for a rich American. Jesse is also reputed to be a wily wheeler dealer who once went to prison for selling an underwater gun to a hitman called Barry the Bear. Hey, Jesse. Mark, how you doing? Hey, welcome to Puerto Rico. Hey, thank you. It's really, hey, really, place. really good to see you. This is where I came to uh, relax the fruit of my labors. It's been my last days here in the beautiful Puerto Rico. So why big shot millionaire like you, why did you end up here in Puerto Rico? Well, you know, I've had a colorful past. Some I regret and some I don't regret. But I always dreamed about living uh, on the beach on an island in the Caribbean. And here I am. You didn't have to leave the States then. No, no. No, I'm not a criminal. Just strike me as a real player, man. You always been like that? Yeah, I've lost all my money two or three times. How much money? A lot. As a storm blows in, we head inside to inspect two relics that Jesse is keen to sell. OK, I mean, that's certainly enough hair for us. Oh, of course. These strands of Marilyn Monroe's hair supposedly came from a locket worn around her mother's neck until she was admitted to a mental institution. That is uh, the real Marilyn Monroe. Why is that important to you? Well, that's uh, the DNA. You thought, that, you thought that at the time even? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. DNA. Sure did. You want a bit of Marilyn? I want a bit of I want to, I didn't want to own something she owned, like a chair or a cup or a scarf or a dress. You know, her dress sold for, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. A dress she wore. I got a real piece of her, her hair, a real piece of her. Jesse also has a lock of hair from assassinated American president, John F. Kennedy. When I was a young boy, I watched that whole thing happen in Dallas, Texas, when John F. Kennedy was assassinated. And it affected me so bad, I stayed glued to the TV. I felt uh, I wanted to be part of that moment. I know it sounds weird, but that's who I am. And that's why I wanted the lock of hair. I have a piece of John Fitzgerald Kennedy right here. The hair locks come with a convincing trail of provenance, so it's time to do the deal. I'm going to propose $10,000 okay. for these two. OK. Sure. I'm yeah. not, listen, I'm not short arm. <laughs> I keep my money here in my pants. I'm okay with that. That's a deal. Marilyn Monroe, the world's most famous sex symbol. Could her genes reveal 
the secrets of her beauty. Marilyn committed suicide at just 36 years old. Would her DNA tell me anything about her mental health? Then there was the medical mystery surrounding her alleged former lover, JFK. Unknown to the American public at the time, he spent his presidency drugged up on excessive doses of steroids, whilst having his finger on the nuclear button. Amazing, isn't it? The future of mankind was in this guy's hands during the Cold War. And he managed to defuse the Cuban Missile Crisis by calm diplomacy. Yet nobody knew you had a list of medical conditions as long as my arm and the clues as to what he suffered from could well be within this lock of hair. Tomorrow, Tim Farrell, 58-year-old guitar-playing truck mechanic, is going to learn whether he's the son of Elvis. He is definitely not going to sleep tonight. And to give you a sense of how important this is to him and his family, I just wanted to share with you a blog written by his sister, Gina. And there's a load of stuff in here, and it's very telling. Is Tim Farrell an impersonator? No, not by a long shot. He's tried not to sound like Elvis, but it doesn't work. He can just keep trying to sound like Tim Farrell, but he ends up sounding like who we believe is his true father, Elvis Aaron Presley. Tim not only sounds like Elvis naturally, he walks like Elvis. We have tried all resources with failure. No one has anything to lose, but lots to gain. If indeed Tim Farrell is the son of Elvis Aaron Presley. You've been waiting a long time for this. Yep, since 78, almost 37 years. Has it been worse knowing that you're waiting for an actual result for the first time in yep. 30 years? Yes, it has. Yep. Yours. Thank you. It's quite scary, you know. Thank you very much for, for doing this for me. This is really good. It would have been more fun, of course, if it, if it had been the other way, but it's really good to know and have, have this done. I've been waiting for a long, long time. Thank you very much. It's good to know. It's very good to know. Does it give you a sense of closure, though? Yep. Yes, it does. It's always that possibility that it's true, you gotta know. It's, it's just one of those things you have to follow up on and you can't just let it go. You know? It's not like I made up the name myself or anything. It was just given to me. It was my cross to bear. And this is, this is it. This is what I need. To prove that based on the hair sample, Elvis's ancestors came from Western Europe and Tim's ancestors in the male line came from Eastern Europe. And on that basis, biologically, there is absolutely no way at all that, that hair sample could have come from Tim's dad. It's as simple as that. So, case is closed.
two years into my mission to sequence the genomes of the dead famous, and it's once again time for the results. At first, I suffered a wave of disappointments. To try and authenticate Napoleon's penis, I needed to cross-match the DNA with another body part. If you took all the hair that is said to be Napoleon's, you would sink a battleship. Evan Latimer wasn't wrong. Napoleon's hair. Hair dealer John Reznikov had three different locks. All these are potentially for sale? Yes. I bought the one with the most believable provenance for $3,000. Professor Schuster managed to extract DNA from the hair, but he also needed DNA from the penis to cross-match it. He asked for an inch. Have you got a ruler? I do. OK, that's inches, that's good. To be honest, you know, I think that could be close to an inch and a half. No. Yeah. Evans soon realised that to authenticate the penis, it had to be destroyed. That would seem idiotic, would it not? So, without the penis, I didn't have enough DNA to learn anything new about the little general. I hoped the DNA in Marilyn's hair would reveal the secrets of her beauty or state of mind, and that JFK's hair would shed light on the cause of his illnesses. But sunlight from decades of sitting in a photo frame destroyed most of the DNA from these alleged lovers. The professor could only sequence around 10% of their genomes. Reading their genetic code was impossible, with most of it missing. The least hopeful was Charles Darwin. The professor only had two strands of his beard that were 130 years old. But could the father of evolution, at least, give me some answers? Darwin's genetic code, his book of life, is made up of four different letters that represent the building blocks of DNA. It's sequences of these letters that provide the instructions for every function in the human body. The professor managed to sequence 50% of Darwin's genome. This was groundbreaking science and provided some fascinating genetic information. Inside the nucleus of each cell are 23 pairs of chromosomes that contain the genome's DNA. On chromosome 19, the professor found a gene for Darwin's blue eyes. On 20, he discovered a gene for baldness. On chromosome 11, Darwin had a gene associated with thrill-seeking. At just 22 years old, he set off on a global voyage on the Beagle. And on chromosome 22, the professor spotted a gene for enhanced memory, also linked with anxiety. Darwin was obviously intelligent, but also a warrior and a hypochondriac. But were there any anomalies in the code, known as markers, that cause disease? On chromosome 16, the professor found evidence for Darwin's mystery illness. He had Crohn's disease, a long-term heritable condition that causes inflammation of the bowel. Symptoms include diarrhoea, stomach pains, fatigue and vomiting, all of which Darwin suffered from. We find a total of 21 markers for Crohn's disease, five of them being diagnostic, meaning that it is used to predict whether a person is more likely or less likely to suffer from Crohn's disease and the major marker on our chromosome 16. On chromosome 16, Professor Schuster found a letter swap in the code associated with Crohn's disease. If you would suffer from all these conditions as, as he did, would you find the time and the strength to sit down and to write a book like The Origin of Species? I think it, even it's not only the accomplishment that he has, but that he managed to do this under the conditions. How important do you think these results are? I think it is the exact new uh, area that we want to step into. It really opens a window to a whole new field of uh, understanding history and understanding the biography of a person who made a major change in how we think about our outside world today. Extracted from a few strands of beard, Darwin's genetic code revealed the chronic illness that plagued him for most of his life. Darwin was right. He did have a heritable disease that may have been passed on to his sickly children. 
he'd suffered firsthand from the effects of his own theory of natural selection, where the strong survive and the weak perish. But Darwin still had the conviction to complete his theory of evolution that explained life on Earth, challenged the existence of God, and is recognized as one of the most profound scientific thoughts in history. Surely, the father of evolution would have been proud that biology finally discovered what was wrong with him, and this made the achievement feel even bigger. So what other mysteries could be solved on the final leg of my quest for dead famous DNA? I meet a dentist who plans to make millions from a rotten tooth. My goal is to own John Lennon's DNA. Wow. I confront a scientist who claims to have cloned humans. How many have you cloned? I'm not giving any number. And I uncover an earth-shattering revelation about Adolf Hitler and Eva Braun. Just in case you missed it, Channel 4's brand new breathtaking drama, New Worlds, is now available for you to catch up on on 4OD. Up next, last orders in the restaurant. Kenny and the biceps are back, but will they be able to sweep Jess off her feet? And some pretty cool ways of breaking the ice from teacher Sarah Jane. First dates.